Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jerry Renault. On this episode, Doug Simon discusses the August WASDE report. Amit Jala talks about how to manage Palmer amaranth in balanced bean soybeans. Terry Klopfenstein discusses improving economic feed efficiency with corn silage. And Steve Martin explains the Nebraska livestock matrix. Doug Simon from Trados is our market analyst this week. There were two major crop reports released last week. According to the USDA Weekly Crop Progress Report, good to excellent condition ratings for both corn and soybeans declined just slightly last week. Nationwide, 70% of corn was rated good to excellent, down slightly from the previous week. Last year at this time, 62% of the crop was rated good to excellent. Good to excellent condition ratings for soybeans also dropped one point to 66%. According to the USDA's August WASDE report, the 2018 corn and soybean crops continued to grow. Corn production was forecast at 14.6 billion bushels, down less than 1% from last year. Soybean production was forecast at almost 4.6 billion bushels, up 4% from last year. We talked with Doug on Thursday to get his take on the latest WASDE report, but began by asking for his analysis on the crop progress report. On Monday, both the corn and the beans dropped one point. The corn dropped to 70% good to excellent. The beans were down to 66% good to excellent. And seasonally, that you know was expected. Crops are starting to mature, and especially this year, we're ahead of pace on you know corn uh, uh, maturity, and the beans are you know they're about right on pace. But uh, yeah, you tend to expect that this time of year. But the big thing is you know where we were last week in the WASDE report and the NAS, the National National Ag Statistics, you know came out and said we had much bigger corn yields than what they were thinking uh, you know, earlier in uh, earlier reports. So the, the yields bumped up quite a bit. And they took the, the corn yield up in that report up to like a 178, and they took the bean yield up to 51.5. So those are big bumps up, about a four bushel increase in the corn bushel yield and about a three bushel increase in the soybean yield. I understand that uh, there were some farmers who weren't very happy about the about those numbers. How accurate do we think they are? It's a little early to tell maybe? Earlier the market was thinking more towards 180 bushel yield on the corn six weeks ago. So I, you know, the, I think that corn yield number is believable. I mean, there are some dry areas in the country, but from farmers telling me we had a really good start this year, you know, dry enough conditions when we planted that we got good populations. And that what that's what uh, USDA said in that report is that like the plant populations were up to 29,500, which is a record. They did use a little lower ear weight, but we'll see the actual field level tests, you know, here coming up in the next report where they'll actually weigh those ears. We'll get a better feel for what that is. The bean side of it, I think maybe bumping that up three bushels a little bit early to do that. Uh, you know, it's been a little drier up in the main kind of soybean growing areas and in, into August. And now we have been getting some good rains here the last few days and the forecast for next week are good rains. So that may be potentially, you know, maybe able to reach that yield, that level, but it seemed to be a little bit high to, you know, to start with. And that report had a little impact on the market. Definitely did. Soybeans were down 40 cents. When you go and you add three bushels over 90 million acres, you know, you add 250 million bushels to your care over on the soybean side. And on the corn side, we added four bushels over again, call it 81 million acres harvested, you know, you added 320 to 350 million bushels of your carryovers on both the corn and, or on, and 250 on the beans. That was a big shock. Um, I don't think the market thought we were going to be quite that high that early. The last time you were on, you said the uh, balance sheet for corn was looking pretty good. Do you still feel that way? Yeah, they did bump up the exports on their last report on the corn side. And uh, the, so the usage numbers were a little more optimistic and kind of ate into some of that increased production. So you've got the carryover still just, you know, under 1.7 billion bushels, which is definitely tighter. Last year at this time, we were thinking it was 2.5 billion bushels. The world numbers on the world carryouts in that 155 million metric ton range, which is down from 200 a year ago and 230 million metric tons, you know, two to three years ago. So the world numbers are definitely tightened up on the, on the corn balance sheet. Okay, so things looking pretty good for corn. Let's talk about soybeans. There's a lot of things that seem to be impacting soybeans right now? Well, if the corn balance sheet looks attractive, the bean balance sheet, both the U.S. and the world, looks terrible. We haven't seen this abundant of a sheet, you know, balance sheet since uh, 2007. Uh, the numbers uh, with that increased production 
and lower exports because of the, the things that are going on with China. Uh, definitely made that balance sheet swell up to like 785 million bushels, which is you know quite a big jump. So the world you know world numbers are also pretty abundant. Uh, so when you look at that, prices were down 40 cents on Friday. Now we've had a little bit of a rebound this last uh, last few days, and especially on uh, Wednesday evening, they actually announced that. Uh, there's a commerce secretary, vice commerce secretary from China coming to the U.S. And so that's actually really good news because there's been no talking going on. There's just been escalating tensions between adding tariffs. And so this is a first signal. Now that's on the commerce side. It doesn't involve the U.S. trade representative, which is a, would be more important for the agriculture side. But to have the first glimpse of talks is, is positive to the market. And beans are up 29 cents on uh, Thursday morning because of that. But when you look at it, I think there's going to be a lot of political pressure and economic pressure on both the U.S. and China. China exports a lot more goods here than we export to them. They have their economy. You look at their stock market, it's fallen pretty you know, aggressively. Their value of their currency has dropped pretty appreciably. Um, the U.S. stock market is in pretty good shape. But we have a lot of political pressure here with elections coming up in the midterms. And so I think both of us have a lot of things at stake, and so I think it's good that they've taken that first step. When you look at that um, worry about exporting those soybeans to China right now, the market kind of had a panic last week in terms of cash basis levels, because if we don't load trains to the PNW, the Pacific Northwest, those beans are gonna stay around here, maybe not go into the Gulf, or they'll definitely go into the Gulf, but there's gonna be more beans staying around here, which has impacted the corn and the, and the bean basis levels last week, which was, which was important to look at. So uh, what, are you, what are you telling people now? What, what should they be doing uh, over the next few weeks? I think next, the most important thing is be looking at, for harvest, you know, what are you gonna store, corn and beans? The corn basis is still relatively good into a lot of processors. So if you have to move corn and beans, in some regards, I think moving the, the corn right now looks attractive. Uh, the bean basis, you know, being 75 under at Fremont ADM and 70 under at ADM Lincoln, you know, is relatively, you know, weaker, I think, relative to the corn. I think there's probably some interest in storing that corn. If you look at the carries in the market, though, there is carry. There's like 44 cents a carry in the soybean market out to July, and there's about 24 cents a carry out in the, in the corn market. So you want to be able to carry that stuff away from harvest as much as you can. Uh, in terms of pricing more, the funds are short probably. 50,000 contracts of beans are pretty negative. They could get a little more negative. On the corn side, they're short um, probably about 30,000 contracts of corn. So they're, they're still a little bit more negative. When you look at going into next year, there's a thought that we might, because of this trade war, add, I've heard, up to 7 million acres of corn. Mm -hmm. So that's going to add a billion bushels to the carryover for next year and put a little bit of a damper on 2019. I guess at some point when these funds get more to the long side on the corn and beans, we'd be more interested in selling next year's corn and soybeans and then make sure we sell more of what we got to this crop that we're raising. So right now we're in a little bit of a wait and see, but we're gonna have to make some decisions. Basis levels, I think you have to really take a hard look at that, and, and if, especially if you gotta go to town, because we're afraid that we may get backed up and there may be you may be filling up, and you may not have a place to dump. So you may wanna get some of that stuff contracted now so you have places to get into. Next week, Todd Holtman from DTN will join us to discuss corn and soybean markets. Managing weeds such as Palmer amaranth can be difficult, especially when crops like soybeans react poorly to certain herbicides. This is why Nebraska Extension Weed Management Specialist Amit Jala has been conducting projects to test herbicides in a new variety of soybean called Balance Bean. We spoke with Ahmed at the Palmer Amaranth Management Field Day to learn more about managing the weed. Balance bean is a new soybean variety which is uh, resistant to isoxaflutol, which is a pre-emergence herbicide right now. We can apply in corn but not in soybean, but now with this uh, new balance bean uh, variety, we can apply isoxaflutol based herbicide pre-emergence and it is also resistant to glufosinate, uh, so we can ab able to apply Liberty type of herbicide post-emergence for controlling glyphosate resistant palmer amaranth. Balance bean is resistant to isoxaflutol, which is a pre-emergence herbicide uh, in corn right now, but now we have a soybean which uh, received an approval and now it should be available in 2019 growing season. So our idea in this project was to compare different herbicide programs, which best program can fit and can provide better control of uh, glyphosate resistant palmer amaranth. So basically we have compared balance bean, applied pre-emergence, uh, followed by liberty type of herbicide uh, post-emergence. Uh, plus we also had comparison of balance bean applied with uh, some other pre-emergence herbicides such as uh, 
pyroxasulfone or acetochlor based herbicides or even saplofenacil type of herbicides. So there are a number of pre-emergence herbicides are labeled in soybean and any pre-emergence herbicide can be applied pre-emergence in balanced bean. But when it comes to post-emergence, you can apply only glufosinate based herbicides such as Liberty. The project has shown a variety of outcomes including which herbicides work best to control palmer amaranth in balanced bean soybeans as well as those that don't. In our project we have seen like when we have tank mixed balanced bean with some other already existing herbicide we have seen very good control of palmer amaranth uh, uh, plus a follow up treatment with uh, Liberty early post emergence before soybean will start flowering was the best uh, combination and additional advantage of that uh, herbicide program is it provides multiple site of action herbicide program that is a good strategy for overall management of resistant weeds and also to make sure like we are not selecting any other weed species uh, for resistant. So when we applied balance B by itself as a pre-emergence it has provided uh, um, about 20 to 25 days of residual activity but after that uh, yeah if you leave it without uh, any post-emergence program it will not going to provide a very good weed control throughout the season. So the best approach was just to follow pre-emergence program with multiple effective site of action herbicides and then follow up with a single application of uh, Liberty was the best approach. Amit says it's very important to prepare for Palmer amaranth early with pre-emergence herbicides as spraying the weed once it's grown will not get rid of it completely. If you apply that herbicide before or after weeds are six inch tall, then yeah, you will get some burning effect, um, but it may, it may regrow after a couple weeks. So that's why this is the message we want to give to all the growers, like whenever you are using, whenever you are using post-emergence herbicides, particularly contact herbicides such as glufosinate uh, or some other PPO inhibiting herbicides that are based on lactophen, acifluorophen, you need to make sure you are applying them when weeds are less than six inch tall. Balanced bean soybeans will be available for producers in the 2019 growing season. When evaluating whether to harvest a field for silage or grain, the issue of how to price and value the corn is often a point of uncertainty. Pricing corn silage can be a complex and highly variable process. But Terry Klopfenstein, University of Nebraska Professor Emeritus of Ruminant Nutrition, says new university research has looked at the synergy of using corn silage and distiller's grains to improve cattle feed efficiency at any cost. We spoke with Terry at the 2018 Silage Conference at the Eastern Nebraska Research and Extension Center and began by asking him how corn silage can play a role in the cattle diet. There's tremendous emphasis in our, in our feedlot community, among our nutritionists and our managers, that feed efficiency is the goal. Uh, I'm being a little bit sarcastic here, but I use the terminology feed efficiency at any cost. And I think the silage illustrates that very well. Because if you feed higher levels of silage, you reduce feed efficiency and it takes the cattle longer days on feed. Now, one nice thing about that is our current research would indicate that those cattle actually end up larger. More pounds sold at the end of the finishing period uh, means more income. Uh, so again, the most recent research would indicate that while feed efficiency is poor feeding 45% silage, and this is feeding a fairly high level of distillers yet, 20 to 30 percent distillers. Feeding that higher level of silage takes more days, but accounting for the yardage, the interest cost for those extra days, because the silage is less expensive for the whole feeding period, I mean, it's 40, 50, 60 dollars difference by using the level of, of silage. And so I think we need to reevaluate our emphasis on feed efficiency and think about economic efficiency. Obviously, we're trying to get people to think about it. It won't fit every situation. Um, it, it, I think it is a great fit for what we call farmer feeders that farm and feed cattle and that usually means their cropland is close 
and so on. The silage doesn't have to be hauled a great distance. They may even have their own harvesting equipment, okay? But if you're a large feedlot, then the logistics gets to be more complicated. And so it's harder for me to evaluate that. The logistics, distance that the silage is hauled, distance that the manure is hauled back to those silage fields, cooperating with more uh, farmers to produce the silage, that becomes a bigger issue and, uh, uh, and, and more of a challenge. But it's really something that needs to be considered. And again, getting it priced right, uh, the manure, of fat, hauling the manure back to the field, uh, and, and thinking not so much about feed efficiency, but economic efficiency. For more information about pricing and using corn silage in the cattle diet, you can visit beef.unl.edu. Nebraska Extension educator Laura Thompson got her start with aerial imagery at an early age. While growing up on the farm, her dad, a farmer and certified pilot, often took her along for flights over crop fields in his powered parachute, giving her an early exposure to getting a bird's eye view of the field. Over the last several years, Laura and her husband Nate have been researching another tool to get an aerial perspective of crop fields, Unmanned Aerial Systems, UAS, or drones. You can read more about their research in the August Nebraska Farmer. Last week, we spoke with Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts about the Nebraska Livestock Friendly County Program and how it supports livestock producing counties. This week, Ag Promotion Coordinator Steve Martin from the Nebraska Department of Agriculture joins us to discuss the Nebraska Livestock Matrix, a simple tool used by county officials to help determine whether or not to approve a permit or application for a livestock producer. Steve explained how the matrix came about as well as how it will benefit both producers and counties alike. The livestock sighting matrix is really just a score sheet, uh, but as you work through it, it's just a series of questions and, and it's either yes or no. Uh, will, will you be implementing a certain practice, yes or no, and, and there's a certain set of points that go with each um, answer. The first section that's scored is uh, DEQ approval. Um, if you don't have DEQ approval, then it's going to stop right there. Um, so that's a, a big section, that's a 30 point section. Um, the next one is county approval, and that's meeting setback distances. That's the main um, criteria in that section. So if you meet the separation distance that the county requires you to be from your nearest neighbor, um, then you get the 30 points in that one. So that'll get you to 60 points. From there, you've got 15 points to make up um, by showing uh, the types of practices that you're going to utilize in your operation. Uh, there's 10 other sections that deal with environmental, uh, water protection, uh, aesthetics of the building and the grounds, um, and just uh, other environmental controls that uh, a producer could put into place and, and score those extra 15 points. And ultimately, it leads to a score. Um, in, in the case of our matrix, uh, 75 points is a passing score above 75 points. Um, and so when a producer scores themselves, turns that into the county, uh, the county can see, and the producer can see, if they're above 75 points, they should have all of their ducks in a row and they should be uh, something that can be approved. And this was uh, an interesting group of people who came up with this matrix and, uh, I mean, it, it had people in the ag business, it had some county officials. Yeah, the, um, the legislature, uh, LB 106, uh, which was passed in 2015, uh, directed the uh, director of agriculture uh, to put together a panel. And that panel included uh, experts from UNL, uh, county officials, ag producers, um, and a few others that uh, were really experts in, in that field of um, the construction, building, uh, management of, of livestock facilities. The, the matrix itself um, came about from a working group that was sponsored and hosted by uh, NACO, which is the Nebraska Association of County Officials, in 2014. And they came together as a group of, of county officials. Um, they brought in some livestock producers, they brought in uh, Department of Agriculture uh, and some others to talk about the fact that we have 93 counties in the state and uh, with local control, all of those counties get to implement their own regulations. So you kind of create this set of 93 different regulations which can be cumbersome 
um, can be inconsistent, uh, everybody's doing things different. So the question on the table was, what can we do as a group of counties to protect our local decision making but add some consistency to this process? And what they came up with was this recommendation for uh, a matrix type score sheet <clears throat> where um, a producer still has to meet um, state requirements through DEQ, still have to meet county requirements through uh, setbacks and other items like that. Um, but then there's also other information in there about what their project is, how they'll manage it, um, how it'll be run, that adds some uh, additional information as they go through that county process. And one of the interesting things is, as counties are now starting to uh, adopt this, uh, counties really have some opportunities to make it their own, do they not? They do. The legislature, when they passed this, uh, made it a, van uh, excuse me, a voluntary program, um, which also allowed for some flexibility. Um, each county can look at what we've developed through the Department of Ag, and then they can adjust it based on the, the nature of the county. Uh, and the goals that they have. So, for instance, Hall County um, recently adopted the matrix as part of their application process. Um, and when they did it, uh, they changed the scoring just a little bit because they wanted to put more emphasis on some of those management things and less emphasis on meeting setback distances. So that's fine with us. Um, the producers, again, they know what their criteria are and as they're thinking about a project, uh, they know what they need to do to meet those those criteria. So if a producer is interested in making some changes and would like to follow this matrix, what would they do? Um, well, it depends on uh, where they're located, but typically the first step for a producer is to contact their county zoning administrator um, and talk to them about what the process is in their county. Um, if the county doesn't require the uh, matrix to be turned in, the producer can still turn it, in, turn it in as a supplemental form in their application, in which case they can contact us. Uh, the, the matrix is on the website, uh, the Department of Ag website. They can download it, score it, um, and turn that in uh, as part of their uh, packet of information. For more information on the Nebraska Livestock Matrix, visit nda.nebraska.gov. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist, Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we again for the weekly forecast. And during this last week, first we dealt with the upper air low moving out of Texas to slowly toward the northeast that we talked about last week and that did bring the precipitation into the state, at least into south central southeast Nebraska as we got into late Sunday and that carried over into Monday. We actually had some decent precipitation across portions of south central and southeast Nebraska lesser amounts as you got toward the I-80 corridor and north of there, but we did have a few isolated reports of two to three inch totals, but real close to those same totals where we had the heavier precipitation, quarter to a half an inch. So the nature of the thunderstorm activity, very scattered in terms of precipitation being widespread. Then we had the secondary low pressure system that moved across the South Dakota and Nebraska border on Wednesday, developed some thunderstorm activity right along that border, but we also seen a secondary pocket develop just during the North Platte area, and that led to some pretty significant hail damage uh, basically to the north and northeast of North Platte. Unfortunately, hail was in the one to three inch range that was reported from the storm spotter network. Now, before we get to the main forecast, the latest long lead outlooks were put out by the Climate Prediction Center for September and the three month forecast. So if we go to those right now, before we get to the forecast, what we will see on the temperature portion of the equation is they're showing EC across a big substantial portion of the eastern United States with above normal temperatures to the west and into the northeastern United States in terms of precipitation, above normal moisture again in the southwest indicating a robust monsoon season is still expected to continue through the month of September and above normal moisture along the eastern seaboard. In terms of 90 day forecast, a much more widespread area of above normal temperatures across the entirety of the Corn Belt and this is not uncommon during El Nino type conditions and in terms of precipitation, once again, that monsoon flow continues and also probably incorporating some of the Baja Peninsula hurricanes that usually form in El Nino conditions and move up the Baja Peninsula into the southwest. So in terms of the immediate forecast, we have this upper air low pressure system going to start to develop to our west in this northwest flow. As it slides toward the east, it will increase our precipitation chances as the weekend goes. But for today, we have low pressure that's going to start to develop in western Nebraska, but there's just not a lot of moisture return yet to feed into this system. So most of the precipitation will be right along the front range of the Rocky Mountains and into extreme western Nebraska. 
by tomorrow this trough starts to intensify and that will allow a little bit moisture feed to the north, high pressure moving into the back side of it. So we'll have a confluence zone just ahead of this high pressure system along the front to generate thunderstorm activity with the heavy of us indicated for eastern South Dakota. Now as we get into the day on Monday, this trough passes to the east of us, we get this cold northerly flow on the back side of it, so temperatures are going to drop to well below normal. Low pressure slides off at the surface into the Kentucky Tennessee area and therefore most of the heavy precipitation will move to the east. It is showing a little bit of it here on the GC, G, GFS, but most of the other models keep that well to our east. Now as we get into Tuesday, that trough strengthens a little bit over the eastern corn belt. It's going to allow a little bit colder air to push down with surface high pressure in place. It's going to feel a little bit fall-like as the heavy precipitation moves to our east and our temperatures will be primarily in the upper 70s north to the low to mid 80s south. As we get into the day on Wednesday, we start to see the ridge from the west building into our region. That means temperatures are going to start increasing in the western part of the state and we'll start to see a slow warm-up in the east as high pressure slowly slides to the east and brings a southerly flow to us, a little bit of monsoon moisture to the west, but overall dry conditions. As we get into the day on Thursday, now the ridge pretty much engulfs the entire state outside extreme northeastern Nebraska. Low pressure systems are indicated at the surface, but there really is no moisture feed that's going to get up into these systems, so we're looking at a fairly dry forecast and temperatures that will return to the mid to upper 80s to the north and the mid 80s to the low 90s across the south. And as of Friday, that ridge even builds farther to the east, so temperatures will be in the upper 80s to the mid 90s statewide. In terms of the temperature forecast, below normal temperatures as the front comes in late in the weekend, and in terms of precipitation, most of the heavy precipitation lays to the southeast of us. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on the August WASD report, how to manage Palmer amaranth in balanced bean soybeans, how to improve economic feed efficiency with corn silage, and the Nebraska Livestock Matrix. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Next week, Todd Holtman will join us to talk about corn and soybean markets. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jerry Renault. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.